Because we're in our uh, last week part of the break, the you know, crossover is the week we get back. And we're still on track uh, for getting four bills out. Uh, by the end of the week, I, I think Ashley will aim for Wednesday, but I'm attempting that there'll be some edits. So uh, back at play is Friday to move out of the Key Waterville, it's 96, which has really turned into a remodeling of the distribution system. We're not doing revenues, that's for being with finance. And, uh, we're just going to the budget based on the last budget that was agreed on the proposed. Um, and then those committees will take it from there. And then Thursday, uh, looking to finish the PFAS bill. And so for that, in order to help prepare people for that, um, I wanted to show you the next draft of the PFAS bill that came out of last Friday's testimony. And I think we're getting pretty close to uh, finishing the bill. So um, on this and on water, I'm just asking anyone, all of us, to review things sooner rather than later. And if you see anything that uh, either needs an edit or a uh, uh, concern that would prevent you from supporting the ability to get all in, please let me know as soon as possible so we can address it. So you can probably get it. So that's, we have water, too fast. Uh, this time of year, as you know, uh, Lake Council gets is in short supply. So while we're getting drafts, while we're keeping those two drafts of water and PFAS moving, wanted to take some time and tee up a bill that uh, we can pass the week we get back, and that is the single use plastic bill. Uh, so again, since we don't have Council available. I'm just going to send it. Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Walk through on S113, an act related to the prohibition of plastic carry out bags, expanded polystyrene, and single use plastic straws. So I'll wait for you all to get that. Shoot, I have a. Okay. Yeah, we're doing the same thing. So, so for today, just like to introduce the topic that things are going, and you'll see why if it sounds ambitious to be passing a bill in two weeks, I think part of the reason I think that's possible is that we don't try to nail everything down. We set ourselves on a pathway to um, figuring things out. Um, so uh, taking it from the top, so it starts with a collection of definitions. Agency is an agency in natural resources led um, working group that gets proposed later on. Walks through uh, carry out bags, disabilities, expanded polystyrene, service product, etc. So, the, instead of digging into detail on the definitions, the concept is that we have, as we've been learning, uh, plastics is in the environment at an increasing rate and uh, fundamental ecological challenge with a public health challenge that comes with it is that they don't break down. They turn into smaller pieces, but they're not returned to uh, constituent elements that nature can rebuild. The thing I contrast it with in my mind is we have millennia of leaves that have fallen on the ground. They disappear because they uh, microflora and fauna consume them, recycle them, they move on. Plastics just turn into smaller and smaller bits, finding them bioaccumulating uh, throughout nature, and um, uh, they're concerns about their ultimately about their health effects. So, uh, given that we live for an awful long time without them, it seems as though that there's a possibility of finding uh, a healthier alternative to continue life. So that's the, the goal behind the bill. There are, you know, people have been talking mostly about plastic bags, single use plastic bags, but um, while we're working on it, we know that's only one of the streams, and so this includes uh, plastics that are related to single use plastics related to things like coffee cups, um, all sorts of food that gets carried out these days is in plastic. You get, um, used up doggy bags, now they are 
uh, plastic clamshell containers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea was to make the, the program more comprehensive and to take our time in doing it. And the reason for that is, uh, in my mind, that we have towns like Brattleville that we're going to hear from that have had successful programs. And um, so one, I wanted to respect and build on the municipalities that have gone ahead, uh, look to them to learn from them about best practices. Uh, frankly, also look to learn from them about hiccups as they try to implement something. Where did they run their problems? Where did they not? Uh, you know, and so that we can create a kind of statewide program that builds on best practices. Um, and because it's a, a more comprehensive vision than just some plastic bags, um, uh, based on past work in this committee, uh, it's my conclusion that whenever we start talking about <coughs> statewide changes to our solid waste system, that there are potential unintended consequences. So there are certainly partners whose business and operations are effective, so let's make sure we know we're, that we're putting something together that works for everyone. Uh, and lastly, I don't know the uh, full um, analysis of what the alternatives are and what the implications of it are. So for instance, when someone said, well, we should just go back to paper bags, um, I would want to steer us in that direction if we didn't even look at paper bags and what's, what does it entail to uh, Great paper bags. What are the environmental implications of using more paper, etc.? What are the cost implications, business implications? And then, practically speaking, if we're going to have food establishments and stores all over the state switching over uh, a longer period of time to get there, well, I think we, that would make sure that vendors could be uh, sourced, people would be able to continue to operate businesses without or minimizing any kind of disruption to their businesses. Um, and, and then lastly, because there may be, by the end of this year, roughly 12 municipalities that will have moved forward um, their own versions of various plastic bans, um, eventually we'll be creating some, uh, we'll have a patchwork system of regulation in the state. So from a business perspective, it will be, once we have settled on the plan, it would be helpful for business to harmonize those regulations around the state so that we're, uh, if you don't have a town A losing customers, town A with a, uh, a plastics ban uh, in place, losing business to town B that doesn't have any such plan in place. Edge effects. We're always talking about that. So, just want to be conscious of it. Who knows? Uh, it would be one of the things we would need to address. So, looking at the bill, just briefly, it says it, it, it lays out uh, the definitions up front, and I'll flag a couple of things that I think we'll want to look into as we learn. You know, I think there's more to learn. So, for instance, um, page two, uh, line nine, expanded polystyrene goes through a definition. I don't know if that definition includes um, a sort of technically appropriate description of the various different types of containers that we see out there. So this is polystyrene uh, foam, but there's also, as I was referring to before, there's plastic set of those clear, bouncy sort of clamshell containers that are increasing the future. So single use, um, page three line, Eight, you know, generally recognized by the public as an item that is going to be discarded at home use. I just want to make sure that we get back to that one and make sure we're not uh, using a, a definition that's potentially ambiguous. There's a threshold in sub 10 there, store uh, retail establishment over 1,000 square feet. That's a relatively arbitrary number. Uh, so we can say, are you for larger or smaller? Then in the prohibition of products, you know, so A says a store sh sh won't use plastic bags. B, vendors won't sell uh, these expanded polystyrene containers, uh, service products. And then C, uh, food service establishment won't use those containers. In D, um, we get into a provision on single-use plastic straws. So um, they're made aware during the development of the bill that there are people 
people, uh, they have a disability that in order for them to drink, uh, they need to have a straw. That's the way that I to understand it. A bending plastic straw is the thing that's most helpful to them. So we don't want to make it difficult for anyone who's out to have um, be accommodated. But rather than having a default, you would simply be transferred. Civil penny penalties compared to our original conversation about this have been dramatically reduced. Um, I'm figuring out it's something for future discussion, but it, uh, uh, the, the tender to much lower penalties, including starting with the one. There's a rulemaking in order to uh, implement uh, the modified or solid waste laws. We need to do that through the rule. And there's a working group uh, with a no uh, interested parties, for instance, VLCT, from our Utah Workers Association, um, the municipality that's already done a ban, the small waste hauler, and the maybe that we want to add others. I would consider who might want to have a member of the House and a member of the Senate on it so that we'll have someone who is well versed in the conversation uh, before we come, the report comes back out of the street on January 15th. So that's it. Um, with that, I don't know if there are any quick questions. So I do just want to say I appreciate you taking the lead on this. I uh, we had a chamber of commerce meeting then a few weeks ago, and I um, you know it was interesting. One one of the topics that came up, which I think is sort of a a little bit of an unexpected positive consequence of this, is it's something that a lot of parents see their children interested in. Uh, you know, there was a little girl that brought a petition, had 150 signatures from the local elementary school on this issue, wanting to do to make certain that uh, plastics you know, stay out of waterways, things like that. So I think it's, it's a topic that you know, again, as a co-sponsor, I'm, I'm in favor of, but I also appreciate that this is something young people are talking about as I think we've seen the shift in, um, uh, well, maybe not a shift, but a real commitment to environmental issues from, from younger generations. So yeah, thanks Maybe we that. can have that little girl call in or come up and she can show her petition that will convince Donald to say yes. I'll measure a couple of tears. Um, well, you reminded me. So in Middlebury, there's a uh, group that's working to get on a uh, ballot on the ballot for the meeting week. And uh, I think they got more kind of signatures a while back. Um, and the group that's working on it is, uh, I think it starts at the elementary school there. There are elementary school, middle school, and high school students. Also, Middlebury College is right there. There are college students on the team, and then there are people in the town, including merchants, who are working on it. So it's been, uh, frankly, a very positive thing to see a group of people say, we're interested in this, and uh, not waiting for, we're not waiting for government to sort this out. We're going to get going on our own and try to push things along. So. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Burns to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group, or VPIRG. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. VPIRG is the largest consumer and environmental advocacy organization in Vermont with approximately 50,000 members and supporters all across the state. Um, as part of our mission to protect and promote the health of Vermont's people, our environment, our locally based economy, we have uh, long worked for uh, policies that uh, prevent waste, encourage reuse, encourage recycling uh, whenever and however we can. And so it is entirely consistent with these longstanding policies of ours that we offer our very strong support for S113 today. I appreciate uh, the leadership of uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator uh, Campion and, and others who are no doubt going to be supportive of this uh, measure. I think it's really important. Um, 
This uh, subject of plastic pollution um, and single-use plastic bags in particular is something that um, I have personally been working on for many years. As a matter of fact, in preparation for a radio program that, uh, Senator Ray, you were also uh, on uh, on Vermont Public Radio recently on the subject of single-use plastics, it caused me to look back um, and uncover an article that uh, had been written about work I was doing at a press conference that I held in February of 1990 on the subject of plastic bags. And for your enjoyment, uh, I brought a copy of this article today from the Syracuse Herald American Wegmans Bounces DeWitt Plastic Bag Protesters. Um, so that was me. Does it and include your picture still? Yeah, it does. And there it is. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> what's happened? <laughs> it, it was in then, <laughs> Senator. So, uh, this is a uh, obviously. You probably want to not share that with us. <laughs> <laughs> I will submit that for the record. Um, this is a topic that uh, people have been aware of for a long time of the problem of plastic bags um, in grocery stores. So they didn't really make uh, their introduction into grocery stores until the late 70s. It's hard to remember that yeah. now. But until that time, uh, people were, were using paper bags at the store, or they brought their own as a matter of course um, at that time. But in a very short period of time, um, the presence of these, these bags have kind of become omnipresent uh, in grocery stores and obviously in other retailers um, around the country and around the world. Um, just, just some historical. So it really was the 70s where, and prior to that, it was paper and even, like you said, people would bring their sure. own shopping kind of bag. Yeah. That's right. Uh, or the European, what we see, I think, a lot in Europe now, still people bringing you know, their own bag or. Absolutely. Bag, yeah. And, and of course, you're beginning to see a lot more of that, that again kind of bag, in, this, yeah. uh, in this country. Um, but as uh, I'm sure you know, the problem of plastics, um, uh, though they've been around for more than a century, uh, they really took off uh, the, the broad, uh, widespread use, proliferation, and development of plastics didn't happen until after World War II, around 1950, um, that you saw uh, plastics really take off. And according to National Geographic magazine, uh, since that time, the world has created 9.2 billion tons of plastic. Most of that plastic, 6.9 billion tons, has become waste. That is, it's no longer in, in current, in its useful form. So of the 9.2 billion tons that have been created, 6.9 billion tons has become waste. And of that, which is no longer being used for its intended purpose, 6.3 billion tons never made it to the recycling bin. So of the 6.9 that is waste, 6.3 was never recycled. Uh, meaning it either went to a landfill, to an incinerator, or it's in our environment somewhere today. Can I, can I um, yes. A question? Are you going to submit uh, your written yes. testimony? Right. Yes, I will submit uh, written testimony of this and, uh, and some of the other um, pieces that I will reference. I won't uh, submit this, but I, I encourage you to, uh, to look at the uh, National Geographic has done a number of things on this topic, but most recently in June of 2018, they devoted an entire issue to this. And as you see, they have a picture of a plastic bag, uh, which is kind of representing the tip of the iceberg in terms of uh, plastics and particularly the problem of single-use plastics today. So uh, it's kind of an interesting graphic there, but lots of excellent um, and well-sourced uh, information there. Would you be willing to leave that for the committee? Sure. Is that OK? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, now, uh, to be clear, there are different kinds of plastic, as you know, um, and there are many different uses for plastic. Uh, some are better than others. Maybe many medical devices today are made of plastic. I mean, you know, the, the number of items that you touch in any given day that are made of plastic um, is, you would be surprised, uh, I bet. Just think about the types and kinds and opportunities that you have to touch and use plastic. And um, we certainly are not here to say that every single use of plastic is a bad thing. Uh, but some are much better than others. And when you, when you remember that about 40% of all plastic uh, that is being used is thrown away after a single use, I think it, it, um, it reinforces the idea that, that this legislation, S-113, makes an awful lot of sense. And of course, plastic bags um, which have a typical useful life of about 15 minutes on average, 
and have been derisively called urban tumbleweed, they have become uh, the poster child, really, for single-use plastics, for an unnecessary kind of plastic pollution. And it's been said that we are drowning in plastic pollution, and that's pretty close to being true. The global plastic production is increasing at an alarming rate. It's an angle like this that you would find um, in terms of the increasing use and production of plastics. In fact, more plastic has been produced since the turn of this century than had been produced in all previous years combined. That tells you how sharp the incline is in terms of the production of plastic uh, generally, and this is worldwide. <coughs> Plastic is choking our oceans, it's fouling our environment, it's killing wildlife. Hundreds of thousands of birds and marine animals die each year uh, because of discarded plastics. So-called garbage patch, which is a gyre uh, in the Pacific Ocean made up of plastic fibers largely, is almost unimaginably large. One estimate puts it at larger than the entire country of Mexico, for instance. And it is not the only one, there are many others out there. If that weren't enough, um, we must also face the reality that plastics are threatening our own health as well. Um, and I've got just a sampling of, of recent headlines to uh, help, I think, make that point for you. Just to, and I will submit these as well, but from the Guardian uh, newspaper, it says, sea salt around the world is contaminated by plastic, studies show. You say, okay, well, that's salt. Plastic fibers, let me just, I'll go yeah, through sorry. these my center. And so plastic fibers found in tap water around the world. So you say, okay, well, that's tap water. Maybe I'll just go to bottled water. The World Health Organization launched a health review after microplastics found in 90% of bottled water. All right, well, so you can't drink water. The Milwaukee Journal Sentinel found that's Tiny bits of plastic are now in beer. Beer is no longer an alternative to plastic center. Um, so we want to keep that in mind that plastics are everywhere in almost everything now that you're eating or drinking. National Public Radio has a story, beer, drinking water, and fish, tiny plastics are everywhere. So these things are, help you take a look. I will submit these electronically as well. A simple search, you will find many, many more um, articles that provide evidence of the uh, severity of the problem of plastic contamination. So may I ask, uh, if with, in your work, aside from folks that are manufacturing these bags, who thinks it's a good idea to continue? Well, uh, what's the opposing, just trying to get a sense, I mean, you've been in this for, yeah. for a long time. Yeah, I, I think, you know, you will find folks <laughs> who have um, uh, come to find that these plastics are pretty convenient. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of why they are out there. So to leave a store, and if you haven't remembered to bring your own bag, or it had never occurred to you to bring your own bag, I mean, that's kind of the position that we have now moved to, where there maybe was a time where people, as a matter of course, brought their own bag and never never would have thought to depend on the yeah. store to provide them right. with, the, cultural with the thing to take it. I think our culture has shifted yeah. so that we now have an absolute expectation that the retailer will provide you with the means of taking away everything that you purchase in that store, and uh, plastic bags have become a convenient uh, way to do that with the handles and so forth, particularly those who are walking, and uh, so paper bags uh, now uh, can have handles as well, and so that's one convenience there if you needed a bag, but I must say that our preference is not to have people shift from single-use plastic bags to single-use paper bags. Mm -hmm. if, if what they're using now is plastic, uh, to Senator Bray's point, the the best environmental solution is not merely to shift to a single-use sure, paper right, bag. Right. Um, it is, of course, to try to remember to bring your own uh, bags um, that can be reused many times. So I think that that matter of convenience is something. But Senator uh, Campion, I would say this is one of those times where we are finding um, a tremendous reservoir of support among citizens out there for this sure, idea. Yeah, you can feel it, yeah. We are not convincing people that it's a good idea to get rid of single-use plastic bags or straws or polystyrene. 
they, they're talking about it already around their dinner table. They see every day on their news feeds the, and more evidence of the problem. Um, we're talking about tiny bits of microplastic in our water and in our food, um, but people are also seeing the wildlife that are being killed. 60 Minutes did a thing uh, just weeks ago on uh, wildlife being killed and the, and the terrible problem of plastic pollution. There's a very, um, thank you, um, uh, popular uh, video um, because it is shocking and it shows a straw in the, in the nose of a, a sea turtle. Right. You may have seen these things, but that's part of what makes kids see this and they um, they say we cannot allow this to continue to happen. I agree completely that children, once they make this transition, yeah, yeah. that cultural shift is happening not just with them, but with their parents and with others that, that they are around. Um, and I don't know about others, but like our biggest restaurants in Bennington County have shifted toward paper straws, which is, I, and I don't know if that was hard, I haven't spoken to them, but the, I think the Barrows House and I believe, um, well, I know for sure, the public house has shifted. Um, of many, many. I, we've yeah. seen that over the course of the last year. I mean, just this past summer, Beeper, we launched a campaign to promote a straws upon request idea. Yeah. We partnered with businesses, restaurants, uh, and bars in helping to promote that. I want to give credit to uh, a number of restaurants in Stowe, uh, for instance, that had already made that shift and they participated with this in this media event. Um, in, uh, in Brattleboro, you know, the restaurants there, Duo and others had been making this change and they helped to contribute, I think, to the public support that led Brattleboro to, to, uh, to make the change and, and eliminate the use of bags. But many of them are, are making the same shift on straws and, and going more broadly than that as well. So you're seeing... And from an economic... You know, there are a lot of people, a lot of anglers in our area, Orvis, all that connection that, again, related to fish and wildlife. It's, it's, it's not only, I think, environmentally, but economic development wise you want to have be able to pull fish out that you know again don't have this kind of contamination that's right again as senator bray mentioned these plastics don't go away you know it has been right. said that if the pilgrims had come over with their plastic bag and their plastic cups and forks and knives and you know, other utensils and so forth uh, made of single-use plastic it would still be with us today yeah it might have broken down into smaller bits of plastic sometimes called microplastic uh, maybe sometimes too small to see but when it is that size, it's still large enough to attract other toxins that are in the environment, chemicals that are uh, exacerbating whatever problems may be, toxic problems may be in the plastic bits itself. And that then becomes a concentrated small particle of plastic which is taken up by wildlife and we may eat those fish. Right? Right. It no, may not be something that yeah. you see, yeah. but ultimately it, it's bioaccumulating in the bodies of animals and ultimately people. So, um, so I wanted to uh, quickly say this legislation then addressing the problem of at least some of the most widely known single-use plastics is right on the mark. It's not the complete answer. I will also submit a, uh, an editorial from the Los Angeles Times just from a, a, a recent days where they talk about the fact that straws and, and bags aren't enough. They recognize the fact California has gone ahead of us in addressing both the issue of straws and bags, um, but that really is just a, a beginning uh, to the solution, I think, that's out there. With respect to 113, we, we certainly support the section dealing with polystyrene as it is uh, now. With respect to straws, um, I appreciate the fact that you have made the straws available to those who, who need them because of a disability. I, I think I would also urge you, though, we've heard some concerns, not only that they want access to straws in the disabled community, but they don't want any stigma associated with a request for a straw. So I'm not, I, I think I might urge an amendment to that language. Just sure. if you make straws available upon request, nobody's going to check anyway. Uh, that would get at the lion's share of the problem, just so that restaurants are no longer, as a matter of course, putting a straw in the drink. Right. You're also seeing straw, uh, uh, many restaurants and bars now shifting to alternatives, um, uh, metal, paper, glass, etc., even pasta. Uh, so there are alternatives available. Uh, with respect to bags, um, again, I noted that uh, we, we would like to see something that would help to uh, encourage people to use reusable bags, to, to get back into the practice of using the reusable bags. And so many places have uh, instituted a small charge on the paper bags so that there is an incentive not merely to shift from plastic to paper, but to do something to encourage people to bring their own bags back. And I think you'll, you'll see that a number of other municipalities, um, uh, states and others, uh, are moving in that direction, and, um, and we support that idea as well. 
I do not believe that it is uh, absolutely necessary to have a working group um, uh, as, it is, as it appears in this legislation because of the tremendous number now of municipalities, of other states, and of other national governments that have taken action here. I think there's much that can be learned. If you do that, um, that working group could advise the, uh, the agency and so forth. So I, I, you know, we certainly would not oppose the bill if it had it in there. I'm just not sure that it's necessary at this time. I think that the um, principal reason for it was not so much plastic bags, which seemed like pretty much figured that one out, but if we're going to get into all the other single-use containers and stuff, um, from coffee cups to clamshell containers, to you name it. I think we'd be happy to talk more about that. Mr. So you said uh, banning plastic bags and straws aren't the solution, but their step. The solu what is the solution? Well, I, th I think it just, you will find that there are even more single-use plastics out there. Um, and so that maybe goes to what Senator Ray was just talking about. But these are some of the most visible uh, and some of those that we can most readily see alternatives available today. So I think it makes sense to start there. But as you shift culturally, I think we will identify more. And it is not a way of saying that we need to get rid of all plastics. I, I just think, you know, these are all petroleum-based products. And the, uh, we keep in mind that we should use as little of that petroleum as possible for uses that are used for moments <laughs> and then last forever in the environment. You know, save it for things that we really need it for. Yep. One smart out comment. That, uh, that report was written before I was born. <laughs> the one that you have waited. <laughs> See, See that's like a long time, time Senator. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yes. The, the other thing, uh, do you have any uh, resources in your uh, um, health impacts? I mean, I think that's another, uh, a reason for us to want to take more testimony or um, soil also, you know, well, yeah. the soils, what's the effect of bioaccumulation? I don't know that much uh, about that. I just was for myself flagging it. We're this committee has become increasingly conscious of toxic exposures that are pervasive, and microplastics may be yet another flavor of that. Yes, and, and Senator, I mean, part of the point there, again, is that you're talking about the fact that they may pick up other toxins that are just in the environment, just as dust does in our airborne environment now. And so children who are, you know, touching surfaces that may have dust, you're not just worried about the dust, you're worried about the toxic chemicals that are hitching a ride on that dust. Same would be true of these microplastics that are in the environment. Um, and uh, just one last example, I, I know you've got another witness who was actually the author of that report, um, uh, Senator, that uh, uh, I think is up next that you'll hear from on the phone, so you should ask her about that uh, report from 1990. But um, we, are, we are about to release some information on plastic beads, for instance, Mardi Gras beads made of plastic, largely single-use plastic items as well, that contain significant quantities of, of brominated flame retardants lead and a host of other toxic chemicals. And in fact, in New Orleans, along the parade routes there uh, for Mardi Gras, they have found a, a significant level of lead right along the parade route because of these beads that ultimately drop to the ground, get crushed, and leave high quant you know, significant quantities of lead there, too. Okay. Thank Thanks very much. It's, uh, clearly, there's a lot more to learn. But thank you for helping us get started. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to uh, have Yes, Sean. She's on the phone. Good morning. Is this uh, Judith Ank? Uh, good morning. Good morning. I can barely hear you. Okay. Uh, so, good morning. My name is uh, Chris Bray, I'm Chair of Natural Resources and Energy. You're on the speaker phone in our committee room. And we are just getting introducing a single use plastics bill. So, uh, straws, bags, polystyrene containers, etc. And uh, we're this is a first uh, first look at the bill, and we're trying to create some uh, context for the, the entire discussion, including why why this is a useful thing for us to do for ourselves. So, Good morning, Judith. Good morning. How are I you? can hear you all much better now. Thanks. Okay. Should we? Is it okay if we just go around the room so Judith has a sense? She's a colleague of mine at Bennington College. Good morning, Judith. Good morning. Good morning, Senator Mark McDonald, Orange County. Uh, Chris Bray. Corey Karen, Franklin County. Okay. Great, so the floor is yours. Great, great. Thank you all senators. It's a real honor uh, to be speaking with you and I'm um, so impressed with your bill and really
really applaud you for focusing on this issue, which is um, so important on, on many levels. Just quick on my background, um, I began working on environmental issues a little over 30 years ago, although it just feels like yesterday. Um, I began working in the environmental community with New York Public Interest Research Group, New York PERG. Uh, I then held senior positions in the New York Attorney General's Office, Deputy Secretary for the Environment in the New York Governor's Office, and most recently served in the Obama administration as Regional Administrator for EPA Region 2. Um, I'm now teaching at Bennington College, delighted to have Senator Campion as a colleague, and um, I'm teaching two classes on plastic pollution. And I want to offer an open invitation for any of you to come to Bennington College and sit in on one of my classes. And I think the most inspiring thing you'll see is a large number of young people who are really paying attention to this issue. Um, if you haven't, take a look at National Geographic, the cover story in June 2018. It does a really good job of laying out the urgency of this issue. Um, what it didn't deal with, however, is that plastic pollution is also a climate change issue because plastics are made from fossil fuels. Uh, for years, made from oil and chemicals. Now it's made from chemicals and ethane, a waste product from hydrofracking. Um, I think we all need to do everything we can to deal with the climate change issue. I'm sure you know of the UN report, um, the scientists who alerted us that unless we dramatically reduce carbon emissions, we'll be facing catastrophic climate change in just 12 years. Um, so the climate change issues are important, but also the water quality issues. Um, unfortunately, we're turning our ocean into unpermitted landfills, and few people understand the scope of the problem. I'm starting to call it the silent emergency. Um, every year, about 8 million tons of plastic enter the ocean. 80% uh, of that waste comes from land sources. So when I first heard the statistics, I thought, is there all sorts of illegal dumping out at sea by boats? But that is not the issue at all. The issue is plastic waste um, that goes off of city streets and washes off of beaches. And I, I want you to imagine it this way. Um, let's say a plastic bag gets through, you know, it, it's littered into a, a river, goes through a sewage treatment plant, it eventually makes its way to the ocean. It doesn't exist just as one plastic bag. What happens is the wave action and the sunlight um, has uh, an effect like a paper shredder. So that one plastic bag can be cut into hundreds of different little pieces of plastic that don't easily degrade and then become available to everything in the sea, fish, turtles, seabirds, um, and eventually humans. Uh, the United Nations has documented 663 species are impacted by plastic pollution. And unfortunately, the problem is just getting worse. More than half of all plastic ever created was produced just in the past 15 years. And the generation of plastic is expected to double in the next 20 years. And that's largely due to the uh, use of ethylene, uh, the byproduct of hydrofracking. So it feels like this is a window in time. You know, it, this is, we don't have a lot of time to get ahead of this. Um, but, but we all have to do something. Um, scientists have told us that in the next decade, for every three pounds of fish in, there will be one pound of plastic. So just think of that for a moment. Three pounds of fish, one pound of plastic, and that plastic is going to be uh, very small and available in the environment. Uh, scientists also tell us that by 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. 
so what are we going to do? Um, one thing I, I want to emphasize is we cannot recycle our way out of the problem. Um, only about 90% of plastics are recycled, um, so that 91% are not. Um, we're not likely to see action at the federal level, so it's really up to local governments and state governments uh, to act. Um, I recently had the opportunity to uh, attend a meeting of the Bennington County Solid Waste Alliance, which represents local governments, and talked to them about local laws to reduce plastic pollution. And there was, I say, widespread interest and in general support for that, but almost every local government rep there said, this is something that the state needs to act on, that it's too hard for us to tackle locally. Not sure I'm on board with that, but I wanted to convey that message. Um, I'm not against all plastic. I think plastic is used uh, in medical devices, which is important, and car bumpers that make cars lighter and use less gasoline. But medical devices and car bumpers are not what you see uh, littering our, our streets and our wetlands and our forests and our roadways. What you do see consistently is plastic bags, plastic bottles, food packaging, straws, cigarette butts. Those filters contain plastic. And then, of course, plastic balloons. I don't think behavior change is enough. I mean, I, lot, I applaud people who take individual action to reduce their plastic footprint, and some stores are really stepping up. But we really need laws to reduce plastic pollution. One that is very comprehensive and on the books is Monmouth Beach, New Jersey. Um, I'm very interested in your bill, uh, which I, I'm calling the plastic trifecta because you're dealing with the big three of straws, polystyrene, and bags. And I just have a couple quick comments on your bill, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. Please, and give credit where credit is due. I Thank looked, you. I looked at the New Jersey bill when uh, back in the fall uh, as a prequel to getting this drafted. So, great. We're building on what others have figured out. Yeah, I can see that. That's smart. It's kind of intellectual recycling. Um, <laughs> so, so, just a few real quick comments, and then I'll wrap up on the bill. One is uh, the idea to have a working group. Um, not sure you need that, uh, but if you do, I would give it a charge to do public education and real retailer education on all three parts of your bill, um, not just bad. And I would also add some environmental voices to the prestigious group that you um, identify and make up the committee. On page three of your bill, um, your definition of store, over 1,000 square feet of retail, um, I would just delete that and have all stores covered by the provisions of the bill. Also on page three, and I think this is the most important recommendation I have, which is um, definitely ban plastic bags, but you should consider putting a on paper bags um, because if you don't put a fee on paper bags, what happens is most consumers shift from plastic to paper and do not um, embrace reusable bags, which from a sustainability perspective is what we really need. I've also been talking to some stores about you know what, what they think of, of the various bag proposals and one supermarket um, had some experience with the Brattleboro, Vermont bag law, which is simply a plastic bag ban and no fee on paper. And their experience was that 85% of their customers shifted from plastic to paper and not to reusable. So it's a missed opportunity. And then for the stores, paper bags are more expensive than plastic bags. Um, so they're nervous about added costs uh, when you see a shift like that. Um, on page four of the bill, um, on, on straws upon request, 
Um, I would add a signage requirement. Um, ask your Vermont Agency of Natural Resources to provide a template to retailers and restaurants so they can just put up a very clear sign that says um, if you have a, a physical disability or a medical condition, you can request a plastic straw. Um, and my final point, oh, two, my second to last point is the civil penalties on page four seem a little low to me. You might want to bump up a bit. And then on page five, um, the effective date of July 1, 2020, I think one year is more than enough time to prepare. So you might want to just have the effective date be one year from the time the governor hopefully signs the bill into law. And that's all I've got. Happy to take any questions and also very happy to continue the conversation and serve as a resource for senators and staff on some of the technical issues related to plastic pollution. Great. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. And thank you for offering up some edits. Um, they, in some of those cases, there are things that others have flagged and some that I was flagging on our walkthrough to say they're somewhat arbitrary, like the 1,000 square feet. You know, let's mm -hmm. come back and revisit that. Um, I do have a question about health. I don't know if this is outside your bailiwick or not. Uh, or maybe you can just tell us that there is there are resources available. Have we figured out what the health impacts are of plastic on um, people, really microplastics on um, um, uh, living things? Yeah, so not, not completely. I mean, I'm happy to send you a very interesting report that just came out last week entitled Plastic and Health, The Hidden Costs of a Plastic Planet. It was uh, produced by the Center for International Environmental Law and others. Um, and what that report and other information has told us is that it's not good to breathe in plastics or eat plastic. Um, there's been some recent um, limited studies. Uh, I know this will sound a little yucky, but um, there was a study of uh, human stool samples, and all of the, the samples had uh, plastic in them. So we know that we're ingesting plastic. Um, food packaging is a major concern. We know that plastic packaging also has toxic additives. In fact, the FDA uh, uh, says that um, plastic food uh, additives are, are legally an additive and that chemicals migrate from packaging into food. Um, I mean, I've looked at a number of the studies, you know, PSOA, then urine samples. I mean, plastic is in our body. What we don't know with precision is what it is doing to us, because there are so many different types of plastics, and you're either breathing in or, con or consuming with water or, or solid food, especially seafood, you're consuming some plastic. There was an engineering study about two weeks ago um, that concluded that doctors are pretty much ready to say that it's impacting our digestive system. Um, but beyond that, um, it, it's an area that is emerging. I'm willing to go out on a limb. I'm not a doctor, but I'm willing to say, I don't want to be consuming any plastic in my food or my beverages. Um, well, thank you. you know, I have a quick question. I was looking at there was, because Massachusetts, I think it's 80 something towns have done plastic bans, uh, a group down there had created a, a spreadsheet with uh, mm -hmm. cells in it that you could edit. And put in your local population, and they will give you figures on in, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, for instance. Oh, great. Um, but one of the surprises to me was that for, and I'm assuming the Vermonters don't behave all that differently than Massachusetts residents, but if, if the model applies, it suggests that Vermonters use roughly 332 million plastic bags a year, which was an eye-opener, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Mm 
Uh, and we spent about $13.3 million buying them already. So they're not zero cost. Um, as we think about alternatives, we'll want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the expense related to what we're currently doing. Yeah, and nationwide only about 5.5% of plastic bags are recycled. Uh, so what you'll hear from the manufacturers of plastic bags is the answer is recycling. And I think on, on plastic bags and polystyrene and straws, that's just not a viable response. Um, we are fortunate about 345 local governments nationwide have banned or put a fee on plastic bags that we can tease out um, some of that data and see what works and what doesn't work. Um, in my experience, what works the best is banning plastic bags and putting a fee on paper so we get that shift to sustainability, which we, we very much need. And in terms of bringing your own bags to the store, which I'm sure most of you do, it's like the early days of recycling. You know, you just kind of get in the habit of doing it, and it, it is no big deal. Um, does anyone in the community have a question for uh, Ms. N? No, thank you very much. All right. And if you could send along whatever resources you mentioned to uh, sure. to Judith Newman, our committee assistant, that's great. We'll share them on our website and make sure committee members have access to them. Yeah, I, I'll do that today. Thanks for the opportunity. I hope we can continue the conversation. Yes, well, thank you. We're, as I mentioned, we're just getting started, so I'm, I'm thinking we'll, we'll speak again. Terrific. Yeah, this is so important. Please, please stick with it. The more I read about the health effects, uh, the more I am inspired to try to get laws like yours on the books um, because, um, you know, there, there's just a range of issues here and we need to scale it up and we need to move fast. So a statewide approach is terrific. Thank you. Thanks again. Have a good day. You too. May I as, just take a quick temperature check of the committee in terms of, in general, are people for this work? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of shocked, to say the least, in what way. I just, it, the pervasive. Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to touch base. I hope that was a bit just to see, because I, I am too. I'm too shocked, so. Okay, thanks. Uh, so thank you, and now I'd like to invite Mr. Morley from uh, Brattleboro to come up. My mom's hometown, I just love it, and everybody can say Brattleboro. Oh, excellent. Good morning. Good morning. So thanks so much for making the trip up. Um, I said we could do it by phone, and, and uh, I, think like in person. I really appreciate you making the extra effort to show up in person, because it really does help us have a better conversation. Sure. So part of the reason there's a delay in this bill, and a working group to learn from municipalities, was all inspired by uh, conversations I had with the press I read about the Brattle Girls program. Okay. And uh, the impression I got was that part of its success was based on a sense of local ownership and development and moving the thing forward. I don't know if that's true or not, so we're here to learn from what you all have done. Sure. So if you'd like, I, I could uh, take a few minutes, talk about the history and how we uh, came to pass a local ordinance, uh, talk a little bit about what it's like to implement the ordinance, what it's like to enforce the ordinance, and maybe some sort of general things that we've learned along the way, and then take some questions. Is that Perfect. fair? So um, this is an interesting story, in effect. Um, it, you can trace it back to the efforts of really one citizen, a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Tim Maciel. And uh, Dr. Maciel approached the Brattleboro Select Board in the fall of 2016 and said, uh, plastics are a nuisance in our community and a danger and a threat to the world. Uh, we need to do something about it. And the Select Board at that is time- MD or is that accurate? I mean, was it, I'm trying to get a sense yeah. of where this was I know him to be a, a, an educator. He, yeah, okay. he was a teacher at SIT. What his background was, I don't okay. really know. I refer to him as Dr. Maceo. Uh, anyhow, so um, the board at that time uh, considered the request and decided that it really wasn't about overseeing the functions of the municipality, but really about how we live together as a community. And so they wanted to hear from the public. Um, Dr. Maciel and some other advocates 
uh, gathered signatures. They put an article on the warning of the, for a town meeting in March of 2017, and the public had their say. Um, the measure passed overwhelmingly uh, in about a two to one vote. And so following that vote, they came back to the select board and, was, and they said, well, you know, what should we do now? And the select board asked the town attorney and staff to take a look at the matter. Um, being a, a, a Dillon's rural state, we started by examining our authority uh, and we uh, rested our authority to take action on this uh, on two positions. One, uh, there's a uh, component of our charter that uh, empowers the select board to uh, regulate solid waste. And there's a provision, a secondary provision in uh, Title 24, which uh, empowers the select board to identify public nuisances and to take actions uh, to remedy those. And so uh, feeling that we were on a, a firm footing, we began to research uh, existing bans in other states and as the last caller said there are numerous examples in Massachusetts um, and, but there's other examples in California and Texas and in fact in Europe Thank you. Um, and after reading dozens and dozens of different uh, ordinances and laws we began to recognize that they fall into one of three categories um, one which was not a ban at all but uh, rather just required retailers to put a fee on, on any bag that they provide, no matter what its composition or makeup. Um, that was very successful, I'm told, in Ireland, uh, it, particularly in promoting the use of reusable bags. Um, there's a ban, of course, which is nice because it is a clear and decisive message that uh, we've had enough of excessive uh, plastics in our community and, and we want to put an end to that. Um, downside of the ban can be um, if you define where a reusable bag starts and where a single-use bag ends, um, retailers can uh, take action to just increase the density of the plastic in their bag and in effect you may increase the volume of plastic in your community rather than decrease it. I think that was an experience that Austin, Texas found. So does that mean that if you make the single-use ones, a lot of them are incredibly yep, thin. Right? Very, very You're thin. You're saying that if you make them thicker, someone might say, well, now it's reusable and you end up with more than being handed out. So you'll notice, and I brought along copies of our ordinance and some supporting documentation. Um, we define a reusable, a, a bag becomes reusable at 2.25 mils. Um, so if it's thicker than that, um, it's considered to be a reusable bag. If it's less thick than that, then it's considered to be single use. Um, and that's the same standard the state of California used. Um, and then the, the, the third approach that we found was just sort of a hybrid, um, you know, putting a ban on single-use plastic bags, but then also putting a fee on the remaining sources. And I think your last caller was sort of advocating for that position as well. Um, ultimately, what our board chose to do was to, to adopt a straight ban because they felt that that was most responsive to the expressed wishes of the public. Uh, the public had uh, voted in favor of a ban, so a, a ban they would have. Um, that ordinance was passed probably in the late fall of 2017, not to go into effect until July 1st of 2018. Um, that was initially uh, a little difficult for the advocates for the ban, um, but I think it was critically important to the success uh, in that having six or seven months gave us the opportunity to get the word out. It gave us the opportunity to reach out to each of the retail establishments in town make sure they were aware of it, answer any questions they might have. Um, it gave us plenty of opportunity to make sure that there were adequate press coverage of, of the transition. Um, um, you know, in our experience, we have um, made a number of substantive changes that will have an impact on lots of people. When we implemented pay as you throw, when we transitioned to uh, every other week trash collection, when we uh, began curbside organics collection, each of these had an impact on large numbers of people. And in order to, to ensure success, we believe uh, really strongly in a plenty of advance notice. Um, the public is capable of great change, but they like to know about it ahead of time. Can, um, can I just check in? Sure. To make sure I got those dates right. So March 2017, you have the vote about moving ahead with something. Yep. And then you propose, uh, council proposes an implementation to be a ban. Yep. Fall of 17. Yep. And then if that passes, 
uh, and then the effective date for the it was July 1, 2018. So we had uh, six or seven months there to get the word out. And the, so the ban was also put to a vote once you had come up with the proposal? Uh, it was put to a vote by the select board to pass in the proper okay. method to pass an ordinance. Okay. okay. So, so it had like multiple the hearings. Town town yeah. I'm sorry? The town vote said go ahead and figure this out. The select board vote was for what the actual implementation was. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So um, July 1 rolls around uh, of 2018. Uh, we've had months to be able to communicate this message to the public and to the retailers. Um, and I, I would say the other component that helped us to be very successful was um, just how dramatically, how quickly, how on top of it um, our two major um, supermarkets were, that being Hannaford's and Market 32 or Price Chopper. In support of. Um, well, I, I'm not sure whether it was in support of, but on June 30th they were giving away plastic bags. On July 1st they were not, and oh, they just turned and off time. Of yeah, interesting. And, and their leadership, I'm, I'm sure, had an impact on many other small retail establishments to say, "Gosh, you know, I guess you know the times they are changing because they they turned on a dime." Um, so those Hannaford's and. And it's called Market 32 today. Right it used to be Price Chopper. It's okay. right on uh, Canal Street. Okay. Um, and each of them were just fantastic about the transition. Not a big deal. Um, yeah. So um, in terms of enforcement, this uh, falls amongst a number of ordinances that we have that uh, it's not a responsibility we put out to the police. It's you know, it's, we don't have a code enforcement officer who's out inspecting and knocking on doors and looking at bags. Um, what we do have, though, are thousands of citizens, and they're shopping and eating at restaurants and retail establishments. And in the first six months, um, they would call, and they'd say, hey, you need to check in with those folks over there. And um, i do just that, stop in, say hello, introduce myself, walk them through the ordinance, Usually what I found was... Um, the company uh, itself. I mean, yeah, you're not talking, we're not talking about policing, you know. Oh, geez, there's Marge. She's on the street with the plastic bag. No, 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 no. You know, yeah, I go to 911. <laughs> right, no, 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 you're no. Talking, right, right. So, uh, I, you know, you get a call from a customer who said I was just shopping at, you know, wherever, right. and they're still using the plastic bags, and didn't, didn't we have that ordinance, and doesn't that apply to everybody? Sure. Yeah. So you'd stop in, and, and usually what you would find is a, either a business owner or a store manager who lived out of town, um, maybe hadn't heard about it, maybe they had, doesn't really matter. You walk them through the ordinance and, um, and indicate to them the types of bags that would be acceptable, paper, biodegradable bags, reusable plastic bags. Um, and ordinarily I would say something to the effect of, well, why not come back and see you in a couple weeks and we'll see what you've come up with. Invariably you'd get a call within a day, sometimes the same day. Uh, I've been in touch with my uh, uh, bag provider, uh, supplier. Uh, we've come up with another option. It'll be here Friday. You know, we're good. And uh, I think because of that, the transition has been um, pretty, pretty, really pretty painless. Um, I will say, in, uh, in addition to one of the things that Caller mentioned, uh, one of the two supermarkets, Hannaford's in fact, started charging for paper bags not long after uh, the transition. And our ordinance doesn't speak to that, uh, but it's certainly something that they're free to do. What are um, they charging? I think it's a nickel. I think they're charging a nickel. And, you know, I... It, there's a whole lot more I think concern about these transitions than is necessary. People are, are capable of great change, and um, um, just speaking for myself, the you know you got to remember to throw some of these reusable bags in your car, but it, it's not that big a deal. And by and large, the community uh, turned changed quickly, and it's the new normal. Did the town uh, adopt a sort of? A Brattleboro recycling bag, or, or is there any kind of thing? I know some folks in Middlebury, for instance, are saying they're having a design competition. Sure. Students are participating in designing the Middlebury recyclable bag. Sure. I don't know if you. Uh, the, the, any kind of the town was not involved in anything like that. Uh, the local downtown organization 
uh, tried to initiate a sort of, you know, like a give a penny, take a penny kind of a thing. They produced, I'm not sure what quantity, several thousand, I think, um, reusable shopping bags and distributed them around town with the idea that, you know, there, there'd always be one at a retail establishment. I think in the end, people just took possession of them and kept them and they're in use. So, um, but the, the, the town didn't play any particular role in that. Um, did you have any feedback from your uh, crash haulers or the, the solid waste district? Um, did you hear anything about impacts of the switch? Uh, you know, I, I really haven't. Um, I, I sit on a local solid waste board. Um, I, I really haven't heard anything from them in terms of, of impacts, but you know, it's it's not hard to recognize. You, you know, you have two busy supermarkets in a in a, in a community of twelve thousand people um, that serves you know the surrounding uh, towns. Um, just those two businesses right there uh, 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 accounted for a great deal of plastic, the exact volume of which I don't know, but it's no longer being distributed in our community and, and um, it's no longer um, as likely to be blowing down the street, hanging off the trees on the side of the river, clogging up stormwater drains uh, or any other nuisance activity that um, it has been before. Um, any surprises in implementing the, the program? Um, the, the only surprise I would say is just how it hasn't been all that challenging. Right? The, the, the large retailers are prepared for this. They've dealt with it elsewhere. Um, and so I think for them, you know, you're just, you know, you move out of this column and you're in that column. You're one of those types of towns. And I, I think, you know, before too long, it's going to be universal, whether it's done statewide or um, it's, it's pretty clear, having used a reusable bag for a while, that you just don't need to be consuming this single-use plastic anymore. It's just, it's not that hard. So, uh, do most stores now uh, sell reusable plastic bags just as part of making sure that there's uh, an alternative available to customers who forgot or just were in the sure. stages of making the switch? There's a variety of, of, of responses. Some provide reusable plastic, others provide paper. Um, I haven't seen any provide compostable, but we, we provided in our ordinance for that. Um, we, we've got a uh, curbside organic collection program in town, and a, and a local waste district has a, a, a fairly good sized composting program. And so, some hope was that um, by providing for compostable bags, you know, there could be a, a, a new waste stream for that. So, I know that, um, that would be one of those things, whether it's a working group or not, to, to dig into sometimes compostable things. In the real world, they, they don't end up composting because the conditions aren't right. Or something right. Like that. Right. I don't, I don't know if they're a viable alternative or there, maybe there are many types well, there you of go. compostable bags. In 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 Brattleboro, I think it's a it's a viable alternative because there's because of the curbside organic collection. Uh, that may not be, you know, the case uh, elsewhere in the state. Okay. Right. Um, and any you, you mentioned a couple adjustments. I mean, so are there. Small hiccups that you had to correct, but not much. No, I, 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 it really hasn't been um, too much of a challenge. Um, there, like I say, there's been maybe a dozen or fifteen businesses that uh, someone would call and say, you, you know, you need to go talk to these folks. Um, and in working with each of them, they've been, um, I think, particularly after witnessing what the the big supermarkets their transition. Everybody, all the smaller retail establishments has kind of just gone along with the program. Um, hasn't been too many hiccups. Um, I think plenty of public notice. And do you have fines if someone... Uh, we do. Like, and what, can you say something about the fine structure? Uh, well, you know, I might need to refresh my memory with that. Um, I haven't had I need you, to use any. Have any fine? Yeah. We haven't issued any. Um, you know, in, in making a transition like this, uh, particularly in the first six months, it, 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 
uh, compliance is, is really what's important and not, you know, penalizing folks. So, you know, you walk in, you meet with a retailer, and, and they say, my goodness, I didn't know. Let me take steps to correct that. There, there's no need to go down in enforcement action. Um, I believe we can, I believe it's up to $100 a day, um, but I, I should probably double check that. Um, penalties enforcement. Looks like $50 for the first offense. And then uh, 100 So. Um, but no need to let the end so far. I, I haven't found it. Yeah. We haven't found it to be necessary. Encouraging you. Yeah. All right. Any, um, any questions for uh, Mr. Morrow? Great. I appreciate you for coming up and using as a resource. It's a yeah. copy of our ordinance. Oh, absolutely. Some Great. background materials. Thank you. Yeah. It does yeah. have one problem. Have you sent electronic copies of that to Judith? I did, I believe. Did you receive it? I did. I, um, I did. I, I'll send it again when I get back I to the office. I don't recall getting all that, but okay. we'll check. And I'll let you appreciate know. it because everything we receive, we put on our website so that people can't make it. Sure. Keep up with it. We'll read much of the Thanks very much for providing Thanks for making the trip up today. Of course. If there's anything we can do to help, <laughs> just we're here. Okay. Thank you. You are miles uh, so far. Wish you luck. Thank you. So, committee, we're going to change gears. We have a quick testimony in the engine room. Oh, going So, if we reconvene up there in five minutes, and that's because we need electronics to look at the mapping stuff that we're going to take a look at. Introduce yourself for the record. Great. I'm John Adams, director of the Vermont Center for Geographic Information. And I'm here with some information about um, impervious surface and parcel data and data needs related to any potential or possible um, impervious surface fee related to clean water. There's no pumping. such thing, but we're happy to hear it. Right. So for, <laughs> for explanation, for the since the uh, press. Before we made that determination that we're not sending revenue suggestion down the hall to finance, um, we scheduled uh, Mr. Adams to come in. And even though we're not ta uh, tasked with that or even looking at it, uh, can, there may well be discussions about it. And I thought it'd be just useful to understand what's available, limitations, etc. So that. Great. So that people don't worry that we're trying to add a parcel fee to our bill in the next 24 hours. Uh, I just um, want to explain. Thank you. And I'll give you an overview and, and talk to you about the status of different data sets involved with it. Uh, things that if you were to pursue such a strategy, you would, should be aware of or that you'd uh, uh, want to consider. Um, so we'll start off with um, impervious surface and uh, parcel data and essentially how we get there, how we map it uh, in the state. So we'll start with uh, impervious surface. So the way essentially it works is we, we take our imagery, our orthorectified imagery, uh, and our LIDAR data, and I'll explain what that is in a moment if you don't uh, are familiar with it. From that, we work with the UVM Spatial Analysis Lab, who are leaders in the, the country and actually working with this, and they uh, using some various algorithms can derive uh, very high resolution impervious surface data, which we have our, our first draft of and we'll be getting our, our second draft of in the coming month or so. Uh, and then with that, um, we also have uh, statewide parcel data, which we've been working on, and our target date for completion of that is January of 2000. Uh, 2020. So with, with those two core data sets, you have a foundation from which to work with uh, to potentially use in different um, impervious surface or parcel related fees. <coughs> Quick question. You were mentioning impervious surface maps and you have high resolution. So at what level of detail can you see? Like to the meter, to the foot? So I'll, I'll uh, walk you through that in, okay, sure. in detail. Um, with these slides here. So just start off with a quick explanation of what LIDAR is in case uh, you aren't familiar with it. Um, how many or how many of you are familiar with 
with LiDAR. All right, it's pretty good. So uh, I, can, I can go over this quickly then. We essentially have uh, a, uh, we have planes that fly with sensors that send out uh, laser pulses that come back with uh, points, with exact locations on the Earth. And you can see here, uh, they'll hit the tops of trees and come back, and we call that the first return until they hit uh, a solid surface on the, the Earth, and then we call that the final return. And with that, we get a, a point cloud. So you can see this is like a tree uh, on a hill here that you're looking at. Uh, here's an example of a uh, point cloud of uh, national life, and you can see the state house in the, the background. So this is sort of what the raw point cloud looks like. From that, we can take, using a number of, of different algorithms, we can create derivatives. So we can sort of strip off all the, the, the trees and the buildings and have what we call a, a bare earth model, or digi digital elevation model, which is very practical for um, uh, modeling hydrology and, and uh, lots of other uses. But, uh, and that's what we can also use for modeling or, or mapping out impervious surface. Um, to give you a sense of the how far we've come in terms of resolution, Oop, I'm not used to this transitioning uh, transitioning slides. So a few years ago, we were at a uh, 30 meter resolution digital elevation model. Uh, today, we've come down to a 0.7 meters. So this is a gives you a sense of where we are in terms of or how far we've come in the past decade or so. Um, so Spatial Analysis Lab takes this information. This is the digital surface model. Uh, this is our color infrared imagery. Um, they run their models on it. And this is an example of um, some of the high resolution land cover data that they've uh, supplied us with. And you'll notice uh, in some areas, you'll have some, some trees over some roads, right? Which we actually have. We have trees over impervious surfaces. So we have to, or what the Spatial Analysis Lab has done is um, derive just impervious surface and a separate land cover layer. So we're looking at, essentially have two dimensions, right? Looking top down and then we have the impervious surface managed as a separate, um, separate layer. Um, once we have that, we can take our parcel data, lay it on top. Um, the parcel data is linked to the grant list, so we have property owner information. And from that, you can then assign various values or run different kinds of analyses um, to determine how much impervious surface is on a parcel. So um, for impervious surface, our first draft is complete. We hope to have uh, a second draft within the next month or so. Here are a few numbers uh, about it. There's an estimated 142,000 acres of impervious. Uh, mostly, or 85% of it, is from roads or spaces sort of associated with automobiles. 14% uh, from buildings, 1% from railroads. Um, this pie chart here can be a, a little bit confu confusing, but what we did was we took the uh, category of parcel in the grand list. So an assessor will assign uh, um, a category, residential, commercial, woodland, et cetera, to a, a parcel. So we said, okay, we took all the impervious surface and said what percentage on, is on what kind of parcel. So that doesn't necessarily represent, um, you, you look at it and you say, why is 5% uh, impervious surface on woodland, right? It's, it's because woodland has, most of Vermont is actually woodland and it has roads on it, so that road counts as impervious surface. So that's the category of parcel and, and what the breakdown is. You can see about a third is on residential, um, you know, 37% uh, on, on right of way, 10% or 11% commercial, and, and that's the breakdown based on the draft uh, data that we have so far. The 14% on uh, buildings, does that include associated parking? or that's the buildings themselves? Um, that is the buildings themselves. So okay. the, the parking areas would be captured by that 85%. Okay, thank you. Uh, a couple things to be aware of in terms of ongoing maintenance. So if there was to be some kind of impervious surface related fee, uh, we'd have to determine uh, how much, uh, how frequently would it need to be updated, right? Um, and to, um, right now, we, we collect imagery on a five-year cycle for the state. Uh, so if, uh, if 
the idea was, well, if updating it on a five-year cycle is okay, well, we can use the, the data we have now. Otherwise, we would need another data source to make those updates from. And that could be uh, from a number of different um, places. Uh, there is no sort of universal or statewide kind of permit review that you could draw in uh, permit documents to update this from, so it would likely need to come from ortho imagery. Um, you know, there's been questions about, well, can you use drones to do this? Drones are great for small areas, and maybe you could use them for targeted areas, but right now it's not economical to do on a, a statewide basis. Um, so that's just one question. Um, you know, how frequently do we need to update it? And from that, you, you can narrow down, like, where, what your best option is. It's also a place where the technology is evolving just very, very rapidly every few months. So it is now possible to use lower resolution imagery to come up with, uh, extract some of that information. But some of it comes down to like how accurate and how high a resolution does it need to be. Uh, we're starting from a baseline now. We'll have half meter uh, resolution um, impervious surface. That should be the highest uh, resolution land cover in the, the country when we're done, so we're excited about that. The, what's the source of your orthophotography, commercial or? So the state um, the state owns it. We um, fly our ortho imagery on a um, five-year cycle, and mm -hmm. we contract with um, vendors to, to fly in those five-year cycles. Okay. When is it planes or satellites? It's, or? it's planes. Yeah. It is okay. planes. Um, Although it's it's becoming more likely that in the future it's possible to get higher resolution imagery from uh, from satellites, but right now planes are are the source. A um, few other things to think about. Uh, so, what qualifies as impervious surface? If you were to say uh, come up with a definition that includes things like. Uh, porous concrete, or if you decide you want some things out, some things in, that can be really challenging. You know, we've mapped out over a million polygons using these automated processes, and that captures what it captures. And if you start changing it, and we can't automate that, it would become could become very expensive or labor intensive to try to manually account for it, if not if not impossible. Um, and then another another big thing is you know who, who is the what is the authoritative source and um, this isn't perfect so who gets to decide who gets to appeal if something is or isn't impervious surface where what is the the process and who's in charge of it should be sort of clearly uh, defined and explained um, and that could be a, a big component of whatever administering this type of um, would be. I'll um, move over to talking about statewide parcel data a bit now. So our goal is to have uh, complete statewide coverage by January uh, 2020. So that would be parcel data for every municipality in the state that we can link to the grand list. Uh, a few notes about um, ongoing maintenance there. Many municipalities currently do not update their parcel data on a regular basis. Uh, and most of the, the data required to update it is primarily available in paper format in the municipal land records. We are working with the statewide parcel advisory board to come up with a program to keep that updated on a more uh, regular basis, but that's still um, a work in progress to be aware of. The other big thing I think to recognize is, um, so p parcel data is very tremendously, I think, in terms of quality. Um, and th these are not uh, surveys, right? We're dealing with a, a fairly old land records management system putting together a lot of old these to come up with this index. And so this is an example. Uh, you see what looks like a, a right of way or what could be a, a road parcel. And then you have the impervious surface, which is almost completely out of it. And this is just sort of a random area I grabbed and, and haven't had these examples. Here you can see the road going out of it, uh, outside of where the parcel lines are. And it may very well be that um, the, um, the parcel lines aren't drawn in the, exactly the right place, or it might actually be that they are drawn in the right place, but that the road happens to not be uh, within the you know, parcel where people believe. So, 
parcel data is as much an art as it is a science in Vermont, and um, it is not perfect. So if you were to think about applying, if you had a very fine resolution, you, you can imagine there would be some uh, challenges there. Um, also, the way municipalities manage their grand lists varies quite a bit in how they categorize things and classify them. When we add up the acreage of, this is the acreage, or the square miles uh, in Vermont, uh, when you add up the, the area that's uh, accounted for in the grand list, we're missing uh, close to 900 square miles, which is about two Lamoille counties are unaccounted for. So just to give you a sense of. So this is, just to get, a, if we, if, because this is going to come to finance this proposal, possibly, or we might talk about it, and I know you've been talking in ways, it means to do this, it, it sounds like it would almost be impossible to actually fairly put a fee and track the impervious service groups. Um, to do it accurately. Yeah, to do it accurately, I mean, I, to do it fairly. Um, or maybe you just you can't take a position on that. I mean, the information, that's what I'm reading it as. But we well, the same problem with uh, flood zones. Yeah, I guess I'm just saying, here's the state here's of the, the data, information and things you should be aware of. Right, right. But there do. may be you know, a way to do it so that it's you know more fairs, but I think it's important to, to recognize that there are a lot of limitations. Yeah, it's, it's, it, the problem does exist with floodways and flood zones and the federal government's maps about um, the, on which insurance rates are based has similar hmm. inaccuracies. Um, I mean, our, our current brand list is based on this, so yep. oh, sometimes yep. we live with these problems. Yeah, yeah. It's evolved over time, you know, over a long period of time. So if you were to just implement it just like that, there would be, you know, it, it wouldn't be easy. Okay. Have its shortcomings. Um, so I think this covers some of those things. Um, Can you explain for a second, third year? What, I'm just trying to figure out what that meant. Oh yes, so um, the the statewide parcel project essentially was we broke up the state uh, into three years roughly, and um, we are in we're finishing up the second year now, and we have the uh, third year municipalities uh, uh, starting I think in a month or two for for their mapping. Um, so lots of differences in terms of. Uh, quality of the parcel data, how municipalities manage their grand lists, uh, things like unlanded parcels, you can imagine condominiums sometimes, some have them as just a postage stamp, others will assign like the greater uh, uh, acreage of the uh, common land, so you'll have all of these condos with the same acreage. So you can just think about if we're, if we're coming up with a system, those things have to be accounted for, dialed in, and, and they're going to be different uh, across different municipalities. Um, and that's it. What were unlanded parcels again? So unlanded parcels would be parcels that uh, would have like a zero acreage potentially in the, the grand list. You think of, um, could be a condominium, sometimes uh, mobile homes, for example. Uh, they have a span number of parcels of tax, but they don't have land associated with them. And municipalities deal with these in different ways. Um, when you were starting, you alluded to the fact that people are discussing how these might or might not be used for um, clean water funding and revenue proposals, stuff like that. So uh, and I know it's a charged topic, and it's not something where charged with solving in here. But uh, have you, uh, to the question of uh, you know the missing whatever it was, 853 square miles, have you seen models elsewhere that are probably dealing with similar issues that somehow someone said, OK, we can we use approximations, or we bin, or we round down, or we, I mean, it seems like there would be ways to work with inaccuracies to come up with a solution that might be workable. You've seen things like that elsewhere? Well, if you look at South Burlington, for example, I think they've just decided not to deal with residential parcels uh, uh -huh. and just focus on a subset or commercial parcels. Um, you know, I think Maryland has done a lot um, with regards to uh, a stormwater impervious surface fee. 
Um, and I, I don't, I'm not very familiar with the uh, specifics of it, but I believe some of them have more involved programs where you have a whole credit system where if someone does certain things to offset them, that gets tracked. So it's, it's a fairly kind of robust uh, program. A lot of places also have much better, um, are starting from much better um, parcel data situations because a couple hundred years ago they decided to uh, go a different route than Vermont and they belong to what's called the public uh, land survey system. So where they have a nice grid and they've been surveying things for a few hundred years now and we were one of 14 states that decided not to join that system. So that and, and I think this project, we're moving towards uh, great improvements, um, but others, some other states maybe are from a, starting from a, a better place than we are. We'll have some of the best, we'll have some of the best impervious surface data in the country. We'll probably have, uh, we can't say the same about parcel data, but we're doing what we can to, yeah. to bring it up. Um, if we never used it for impervious surface, uh, for any kind of revenue thing, the towns are still the, the data has value in and of itself, regardless if you're talking about revenue based on the previous surface. So, oh, absolutely. And is so are you is ANR sort of a client of the the center in terms of you're helping them figure out impervious surface or V trans or how do you forgetting all this revenue stuff, mm -hmm. how are you working with other agencies now and how are they using their data? Yeah, well, pr our primarily part of, part of our role is, is uh, capturing it and serving it out in a way that all of these agencies and different people can use it. But uh, for one, one example of how we're using it for the building footprints, for example, uh, working with E911, so looking at their E911 points, and if we have a building and we don't have an address there, then, you know, why not? Then we, that gets us to, has, has them look into, did they miss something? So they, they include that. We then use that information to help us with the um, census master address file, which once every 10 years we get a small window, which they give us their address file, and we can update in preparation for the 2020 census, uh, and making sure that we get um, an accurate count for the 2020 census is uh, critical given the amount of federal funding that's dependent on those counts. So um, that's just one example of where this state has more than paid for itself in terms of its utility. Jerry McDowell. Could you go back to this uh, chart, the pie chart that have that attempted to publicate maybe a third way in the, the, um, the various land surfaces that were mm -hmm. attributed to different I just escape out of here. Oh, it's impervious. So, of course, it's not farmland. It's just like three, so what's that? Farm, where it says farm three fourths. Um, right, so farms three point four percent. So of all the impervious surface, uh, in and I should clarify, this is for one hundred and seven municipalities that we have parcel data for. So of those, we said what percentage of impervious is on what kind of parcel? So it'd be like barn roofs, barn, barn roofs, road, yeah, farm roads, farm roads. Same with uh, you know, commercial ones that uh, we're talking about mostly parking lots there or, or parking lots and roofs? Well, most of all the impervious surfaces, roads and parking lots on all of these types of uses, with the exception of railroads, of course. And, um, hmm. And they, the, the the road up there, that's the roadway itself, not the right of way on either side. Right, it's not the parcel. It's like we we can differentiate between um, building, road, and other impervious surface. So we have three sort of classes of impervious. Okay. 
So we got if we just eliminated all the odd numbered roads, we could cut our pretty surfaces in half. Thank you. All right, great. Um, any other questions for Mr. Adams? All right. That's good stuff. Yeah, thank good you very much. Stuff. Thank you very um, much. You know, I do have a funding question, so I um, sometimes I just would. Are you fully funded, and or, or are there single uh, one-time dollars driving some of this work? It, is, it seems as though there's a lot of value in this work, and that it's been it's taken years to develop, and then it needs to be maintained. So um, I'm just trying to check in and see if you can say whether or not your funding is steady and sustainable, and or if there's any sort of precariousness about it. I, um, so we are uh, funded. We have a number of different uh, funding sources that the center draws from, including the um, municipal and regional planning fund that comes from the um, property transfer tax. Um, the parcel data uh, program is funded through uh, primarily through federal highway dollars, VTRANS, as well as partnership between seven other agencies who contribute to the match. Um, and then the impervious surface was, uh, and uh, uh, land cover data was funded through a partnership of a variety of different um, funding sources. The Lake Champlain Basin actually uh, started the, the work by covering Lake Champlain Basin and doing the uh, land cover there, which dramatically reduced the cost for us to sort of do the add-on and do the rest of the state. Um, that was a, a one-time funded project. We don't use any of that for our operational funds. That goes purely towards uh, contracting. So if this was to be maintained over time, it would uh, need to have, we're, we're starting to explore what long-term maintenance of this could look like. Could there be different stewards who take, take it on? But we're focused on getting it done getting it done first now, having a good baseline of, of the producer. Okay. Well, thank you again. Oh, something right now. Yes. Is, is, is there any measure of tilled land, land that's plowed and, and uprooted? Um, so, so we'll have about 16 different land cover classes. Tilled land isn't a class, but we'll have you know, grassland, we'll have, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank on a lot of our other ones. Cropland. I mean, grassland is cultivated, it's cropland, but it's not necessarily. We'll have cropland, we'll have, basis. you know, barren land, we'll have, and some of those will, um, there's a greater margin of error than other land classes, and we're still figuring, figuring that out. Wetlands, for example, is one that, is so trickier, tilled. seldom tilled, but also, uh, you know, we can we can we can tell you certain types of classes with a, a certain amount of accuracy, and others are trickier. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but rains it in a little bit. Thanks. So thank you once again. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So committee, we are done for the day and adjourned. Wow.